Education and Labor will, uh, will come to order uh, for the purposes of uh, conducting a hearing on uh, the issue of uh, underreporting of workplace injuries and illnesses. Um, the occupational, uh, and I recognize myself for the purpose of an opening statement, uh, the Occupational Safe Safety and Health Act of 1970 requires that the U.S. Department of Labor to collect and compile accurate statistics on occupational injuries, illness, fatalities in the United States. Accurate injury and illness records help the Occupational Safety and Health Administration better allocate its resources, accurately target, target its inspections, and evaluate the success of its efforts to improve the health and safety of American workers. Every time top officials from the Department of Labor Occupational Self Safe Safety and Health Administration have appeared before Congress, they have cited declining injury, illness, and fatality numbers to demonstrate their effectiveness in protecting America's working men and women. When Assistant Secretary Falk came, uh, has testified before the committee whether an OSHA's failure to issue standards to protect workers, OSHA's failure to address the fatal pop popcorn lung disease, or OSHA's failure to mitigate combustible dust hazards, or OSHA's shortage of inspectors, he has cited a record of low injury and illness statistics. Secretary Folk has essentially told the committee that if fewer workers are being injured on the job, the agency must be doing something right. However, a growing amount of evidence suggests that workplace injury statistics, S Secretary Folk's cites, are grossly inaccurate. Today we will hear about the growing numbers of, of academic studies that conclude that the Department of Labor is actually counting and reporting as few as one-third of all workplace illnesses, injuries, and deaths. Some of the undercounting can be blamed on the fact that millions of public employees and self-employed workers are not required to report injuries and illnesses to the Department of Labor. Some of it is a result of the difficulty in counting occupational illnesses like cancer or asthma that may appear years after a worker's initial workplace exposure. However, critics also correctly point to a more significant reason why they are difficult to get accurate injury and illness data. The nation's workplace injury and illness report card is based upon a system of self-reporting by employers. This flawed system gives employers an incentive to underreport injuries. The fewer injuries and illnesses an employer reports, the less likely it will be inspected by OSHA and the more likely it will pay lower premiums for workers' compensation. There is also mounting evidence that a number of employers are engaging in intimidation in order to keep workers from reporting their own injuries and illnesses. The recent Charlotte Observer investigation on the hazardous working conditions in North Carolina's poultry industry revealed a shocking record of worker abuse and exploitation, often leading to crippling injuries and illnesses. The Observer also uncovered concerted efforts by, of discipline and, and, and intimidate and fire workers in retaliation for reporting serious on-the-job injuries. The Observer found that workers were forced to return to work immediately after having surgery so that the company would have to would not have to file for workers' compensation. I want to commend the Charlotte Observer for their amazing work on this important story on revealing working, working conditions that remain hidden to most Americans. We learned about workers with shattered ankles and workers whose hands went numb after thousands of repetitive motion, workers who suffered serious knife cuts while on the job, but none of these injuries appeared on the poultry company's accident or injury logs as required by law. We also read about the very same poultry processing plant proudly claiming a perfect safety records, records that were hard to believe if you know anything about the hazardous working conditions. Underreporting of on-the-job inju injuries and illnesses is, is not a new problem, nor is it an isolated one. It happens in job sites across different industries and throughout the entire country. As demonstrated by the extensive report released in this committee today, it is, it is a regular practice for the steel workers to avoid detection and therefore retaliation by management by keeping their injured hands in their pockets. This is known as a bloody pocket syndrome. A, a recent transportation committee hearing also revealed similar patterns in the rail industry. And the, the threats are not just limited to workers. We will hear a testimony today that occupational physicians are often pressured and improperly report to, to improperly report to provide inappropriate treatment to injured workers in order to keep the incidents off of the OSHA log. Although there is widespread agreement that workplace injuries and illnesses are woefully unreported, OSHA refuses to recognize that the problem exists. The agency stubborn, stubbornly refuses to perform thorough audits, which further calls into question the accuracy of the statistics it relies on. Today we will hear testimony from a longtime OSHA official about the agency's failure to seriously address this problem. Some will dismiss record-keeping problems as insignificant paperwork violations, but these infractions are anything but insignificant. 
Without accurate injuries and illness statistics, employers and workers are unable to identify and address safety and health hazards that ensure that the workers get appropriate medical treatment. We cannot properly evaluate the status of our nation's workplace safety and health laws in this country if we do not start with accurate information. We simply must not allow the lack of information to permit hazardous working conditions to go unaddressed, putting workers' limbs and lives at risk. The purpose of today's hearing is to evaluate the extent and the cause of this problem and, and to learn what we can do to improve reporting in order to protect workers' health and safety. I am grateful to all of our witnesses for taking the time to join us today, and I look forward to your testimony. At this point, I would like to recognize Congressman McCain, who is, is the, uh, the senior Republican on the committee, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Miller, and good morning. We are here today to examine how the Department of Labor collects statistics on workplace injuries, illnesses, and fatalities. Under OSHA's record-keeping system standard, employers record and report work-related injuries, illnesses, and fatalities. This data is then used to evaluate the effectiveness of the agency's practice and to target industries and companies with high evidence rates for future inspection. I understand that today's hearing was triggered in large part by a series of newspaper articles that were published earlier this year in which it was alleged that a certain business has not been properly or accurately reporting its employees' injuries and illnesses to OSHA. Such an allegation is troubling and certainly warrants further investigation. But, Mr. Chairman, you know as well as anyone that I hesitate, well, and I think we all hesitate, to draw broad-based conclusions from examples that have not been fully investigated. For that reason, I hope today's hearing is approached as an opportunity to listen and learn rather than to seek evidence that supports existing conclusions. OSHA's record-keeping standard is an important tool that allows us to monitor workplace safety and target initiatives that can reduce injury and illness. Because of its importance, I appreciate the opportunity to look more closely at the data collection methods used for the record-keeping standard. The information gathered through this standard helps ensure effective enforcement of workplace safety standards. I also think we need to look more closely at the guidance offered to employers about what to record, what to report, and when to do so. Employers are held responsible for compliance with this standard, which is why it is important that they be given clear guidance about their responsibilities. I expect that the discussion today may turn to questions about the accuracy of the data associated with the record-keeping standard. It is a valid concern, and that is why I look forward to hearing from our witnesses with the Bureau of Labor Statistics about the audit process in place to ensure the integrity of the data reported and collected under this standard. Ultimately, I think the greatest value we can draw from today's hearing is a greater understanding of the mechanisms in place to ensure the prompt and accurate reporting of relevant workplace injury and illness data. I look forward to such a discussion, and I yield back to balance my time. I uh, thank the gentleman again. Let me welcome the, uh, the witnesses to today's hearing. We look forward to your testimony, and we certainly appreciate the, uh, uh, the time that you are giving over to the, uh, uh, to the committee inquiry. Let me begin by introducing uh, A.C. Spahn, uh, Jr. Uh, work, he worked for six months at Basha's dis Distribution Center, a food warehouse and distribution center located in Chandler, Arizona. Originally from Chicago, A.C. worked in home construction before moving to Arizona. He is the father of an 18-year-old daughter, and he worked as a bailer at Basha's. A.C. loaded, and in doing that, he loaded and unloaded trucks, sorted pallets, cleaned ice cream totes, and flattened cardboard boxes. In January of 2008, he was fired from uh, Basha's. Dr. Robert McClellan is, is an immediate past president of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. He is a board-certified occupational medicine physician, additional certification in family medicine. Dr. McClellan has an extensive experience in occupational medical consultant to business in a wide range of economic sectors, including health care, manufacturing, nuclear energy, and public safety. Baru Fellner is, is representing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He is a partner in, in Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher in Washington, D.C., practicing in the area of labor relations. He has also worked in the Solicitor's Office at the Department of Labor and in the Appellate Court Branch of the National Labor Relations Board. Mr. Fellner received his B.A. from George Washington University and a law degree from Harvard Law. John W. Rooser 
uh, is served as Assistant Commissioner of Safety, Health and, and Working Conditions at, at the uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics since November 2006. Dr. Rooster is responsible for the Census of Fatal Occupational Injuries, the Survey of Occupational Injuries and Illness, and Special Surveys. Mr. Rooster holds a, Dr. Rooster holds a Ph.D. and M.A. Uh, degrees in Economics in the University of Chicago and a B.A. from Economics from Princeton University. Kenneth Rosemann, uh, Dr. Rosemann, is a professor of medicine and chief of the Division of Occupational Environmental Medicine at Michigan State University. Dr. Rosemann is a board certified in internal medicine and occupational medicine, and he received his medical degree from the New York Medical College in 1975. He's a fellow of the American College of Epidemiology and the American College of Preventative Medicine. He also also has published approximately 145 articles on occupational and environmental disease. Bob Whitmore is, is in charge of OSHA's injury and illness record keeping activities in the Office of Statistical Analysis since 1988 and was employed as an economist in the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, from 1972 until 1990. He has been the Department of Labor's expert witness on OSHA record keeping litigation and member of the OSHA's significant significant case team and has personally reviewed all the egregious and significant record-keeping cases since late 1986. He has obtained his B.S. degree in economics from the University of Baltimore in 1972, and he is speaking uh, today on behalf of himself and not representing uh, OSHA. Uh, as we inform the uh, witnesses, because of the importance of getting complete, full, and truthful testimony, the witnesses in an investigative hearing before the, uh, the Committee in Congress are sworn in, and our witnesses will Will, uh, will be sworn today. So before we move to your testimony, if I could ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. And I will ask of you, uh, do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give, that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the uh, record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative, and thank you very much uh, for that. And now, Mr. Mr. Spahn, we will hear from you. Uh, under our system, a green light will go on when you begin to testify, uh, which gives you five minutes, and then uh, four minutes into your testimony, an orange light will go on and give you an idea to start to wrap up, but we want you to complete your thoughts, and then a red light will go on when your five minutes is up. But again, okay, feel free to complete your sentences or your, or your thoughts at that point. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you. And, the and we're going to ask you to bring the microphone a little bit closer to you. First of all, I'd like to thank, thank you. you and the committee for giving me the opportunity to be here in Washington to testify at this hearing. My name is A.C. Spann. I recently moved to Arizona from Chicago, Illinois. And doing so, I heard wonderful things about the Bachelors of Corporation. So I applied for a position there. And thank God they gave me the opportunity to go to work there. I was told that I would be part of the Bachelors family. I was also told that it would be an open door. As being employed there, I was employed on the baler. It's a department that shreds the paper and unlo unloads the tractor trailers. I was given five minutes of training on the heavy equipment that I must operate on an eight-hour basis. Uh, as being there, I witnessed a lot of uh, debris scattered around on the docks as well as the plates. And it was, you know, by my concern by me being a diabetic, it, you know, I had to pay attention to the things that was around me because I also witnessed people getting ran over, getting their fingers smashed and taping them up, scared to report these accidents because of the fact Bash's policies, which Bash's have a policy of a point system of 16 points and you immediately walk out the door. Uh, and also they have another policy with the injury, the, if you get hurt on a job and you report it and you go on a light duty from making 19 to $20 an hour, your pay is dropped. You know, so a lot of people that work there have been there for years, they can't afford from their pay to drop the minimum wages, considering the price of gas and everything else there in Arizona. As I started working, I witnessed a lot of things that need to be changed there, you know. And uh, so me and some more people that work with me decided to get a safety committee going. And we tried to approach the Bash of the Corporation many a times, you know, and uh, we had a petition. And with every time that we went, the door was actually closed in our face. So we decided to call OSHA and have them to come in. And it's sad that uh, OSHA came in and they gave us the investigation was very poorly because, you know, when I drive a car and the speed limit say 35 miles per hour and I'm doing 40, 
I'm being punished for it. And OSHA did not, they wrote a report and they had bashes to fix certain things, but it was sad that, you know, they, it wasn't even a smack on the wrist. And here it is in a plant that's, uh, people are being hurt on a daily basis and they're scared to report it because of the fact that the bashes is, uh, is uh, punishing them for it, you know? So most of the workers there do not, do not at all report any injuries because of the fact that the policy that the Bashes Corporation had set forth. And uh, I'd like to take the time to uh, medical. You have to wait six months before any medical is provided for you there. And, and it's sad that the workers have to go through this and they're going through it today. There's very little training at all, you know, when you are hired there, you are you just out there, you're being thrown out there, and this is the way you have to get the job done. At the Bashes of Corporation, the order selector, they pick the orders for 166 stores. You are put on a time limit to have these pieces and have them ready within a certain length of time or you can be either suspended or fired. You give them points for these things. So with the lack of the training to operate this heavy equipment, as well as the pressure that then put on you to pull these orders, it's chaos. And at the time that OSHA did come in, it's a surprise and alarming that the company will shut down their operations. While OSHA in the building, we were told not to get on any heavy equipment, you know, and I'm surprised that OSHA didn't catch on to this as well, that the whole plant was just in there sweeping. <laughs> you know, and it's sad that all this stuff is happening and, uh, and OSHA was supposed to be there for us. We contacted OSHA, but we have no response or anything in that nature concerning the safety. You know, it's sad that people have to go to work and to look over their shoulders or watch to make sure they don't step on any nails or for a guy to get on a two-ton pallet jack and drive with no training. You know, it's a very scary sight, but, you know, even to imagine that this is happening, you know. I never experienced anything like this before. And also, you know, to see my fellow employees get ran over, by, you know, and have their toes amputated as well as their fingers smashed. And they're just taking tape to tape their fingers back up because they're scared to report these injuries because of the fact you would get punished for them. And this punishment goes as far as the point system, and this punishment also goes as far as my pay scale is getting cut. You know, and it's, you know, it's not right at all. And I'm sitting here to testify to, from my experience, what I have seen. And I hope that, you know, we can make a difference and a big change. Thank you. Dr. McClellan. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I am Robert McClellan, an occupational medicine physician and the immediate past president of the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, known as ACOM. I serve as the Chief of the Section of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and as Associate Professor of Medicine and Community and Family Medicine at Dartmouth Medical School. Founded in 1916, ACOM represents more than 5,000 physicians and other healthcare professionals and is the nation's largest medical society dedicated to protecting and promoting the health of workers. ACOM's interest in OSHA record keeping stems from our role as physicians with a dual mission. We provide direct care to workers in the clinic, and we serve as public health officers of the employed population. Over the last year, I had the opportunity to tour the country to meet with occupational physicians working in a variety of settings. During these visits, physicians reported that some employers exerted pressure on them to alter treatment and or return to work statement in ways likely to minimize OSHA recordability. Based on the frequency of this report, I suggested that ACOM convene a special session on OSHA record keeping at ACOM's recent annual scientific meeting. My testimony today represents the results of preliminary exploration of this issue by our college. The OSHA log has grown to serve many purposes beyond that for which it was originally designed. For example, today, many owners select contractors on the basis of the contractor's rates for lost work days and total recordables. At its best, this practice results in intensive efforts to improve safety. At its worst, however, the spotlight on the log produces efforts to make the log look good rather than placing attention on reducing risks. 
ACOM members report that various incentive programs to produce, to produce a good OSHA log have distracted safety programs from the primary goal of prevention. When workers and managers are promised valuable prizes to avoid recordable injuries, our members have observed pressures to underreport. In brief, when a single metric becomes the focus of safety efforts, it can become distorted by a variety of forces. ACOM, ACOM has not conducted its own systematic research on this issue, but we find anecdotes of distorted reporting troubling, indicating a process and a system in need of review because of the potential for causing both medical harm and flawed statistical results. Let me give just a few examples. We observe first that there is a wide variability in employers' understanding and application of the record-keeping standard. Many employers make every effort to comply assiduously to the letter of the standard. Others, particularly smaller employers, find the rule inordinately complex and confusing and complete the log incorrectly through ignorance of the rules. A number of our members complain that distinctions in the standard between first aid and medical treatment are nonsensical and drive bad medical practice. Several members indicate that selected workers, employers, and insurance companies have tried to influence medical treatment in ways that may result in harm to a worker or, in some cases, excessive costs. For example, certain employers have asked clinicians to write work as tolerated on the return to work form to avoid recording lost work days. A member reported that the employer then expected the worker with a fractured leg to sit in a wheelchair at a construction site. One member relayed an instance where a safety team at, uh, at a site without an on-site medical office inappropriately controlled access to health care providers in the context of plant incentive programs that rewarded the absence of recordable injuries. She intervened when she learned that after a worker was exposed to vinyl chloride, safety personnel had applied a hazardous chemical, potash, to the worker's skin since they had read that potash could be used to neutralize environmental spills. In view of these examples and many others detailed in our written testimony, ACOM's advocacy on OSHA record keeping is quite straightforward. Number one, physicians must always do the right thing for the patient. Although health care providers do not have a regulatory obligation under the standard, they do have an ethical obligation to correctly diagnose, report, and treat injuries. Number two, we believe that OSHA must encourage a better understanding of the requirements and interpretations of the record keeping standard. Number three, it's time to consider updating the current OSHA record keeping standard and its enforcement to minimize underreporting. Number four, it is time for OSHA to consider undertaking a special emphasis program to increase the number of medical records reviewed as part of OSHA's audit and verification program of occupational injuries and illness records. And number five, ACOM supports efforts to broaden the suite of occupational health indicators used at a national, state, and facility level in order to improve the quality of the data necessary to prevent work-related injuries and illnesses. Our intention today is not to point fingers, but rather to seek solutions that are based on doing what's right for the patient and that are grounded in good science and best occupational medicine practices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Rooster? Thank you, Chairman Miller. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman Miller, Congressman McKeon, and members of the committee for inviting me to talk about the workplace injury and illness statistics produced by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The BLS provides annual estimates of workplace injuries, illnesses, and fatalities from two separate programs. These are the Census of Fatal Occupational Injuries and the Survey of Occupational Injuries and Illnesses, often called SOI. It is this survey that has come to be the focus of much of the undercount allegations, so it will be the focus of my remarks today. The survey is a federal state cooperative program that estimates the number and rate of new non-fatal workplace injuries and illnesses. The data are obtained from a sample of employers who gather their information from OSHA logs and supplementary materials they keep throughout the year. Because the data come from OSHA logs, the injuries and illnesses counted by our survey are OSHA recordable cases only. These cases may differ from those counted in other data systems such as workers' compensation. An important advantage of this survey is that it provides the most complete occupational injury and illness counts available for the nation and consistently across states. This includes estimates by state and industry that state policymakers use to track their own injury and illness experience compared to similar states. Other surveillance systems do provide some estimates of workplace injuries and illnesses. However, these other systems 
tend to collect only a small amount of data, or they are not consistent across states. Recently, some academic studies have asserted that our survey undercounts the total number of workplace injuries and illnesses. A review of this literature suggests that three different types of undercount are asserted. First, it is pointed out that the survey does not count most long latent occupational illnesses such as cancer. The BLS has long acknowledged this point. Many work-related illnesses take years to develop and may be difficult to attribute to a specific workplace. A system based on employer records like our survey does not capture most of these illnesses. Instead, the overwhelming majority of new reported illnesses in our survey are those that relate more directly to the workplace. The undercount literature also mentions that we do not count occupational injuries and illnesses incurred by workers outside of the survey scope. That is, the survey does not include all public sector workers, the self-employed, workers in households, and on small farms. To partially address this issue, we are expanding our survey to include government workers. Starting with the 2008 survey, BLS will collect state and local government data for all states. This will allow us to estimate provide estimates for some high hazard public sector occupations such as police and firefighters. In addition, BLS is exploring with OSHA ways to collect data for federal government agencies. It is more difficult to, co to collect data for other groups of workers. These workers, principally the self-employed, are not covered by the Occupational Safety and Health Act and are not required to record injuries and illnesses. In addition, BLS samples establishments from a list of those on a state unemployment insurance rolls. The self-employed are rarely on this list. BLS has held discussions with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, and with some other groups on ways to utilize other data to estimate workplace injuries and illnesses for these non-covered groups of workers. The last undercount allegation is that our survey does not count some worker injuries and illnesses that are within scope of the survey. These allegations come from academic studies that match individual case data in the survey to data in other surveillance systems, such as workers' compensation. The studies typically find that the survey and the other data systems each miss a substantial number of cases. The BLS takes claims of potential underreporting seriously and has begun a number of activities to understand and, if necessary, address the issue. First, in 2007, BLS conducted a quality assurance survey that indicated that the survey accurately captured the data entered on employers' OSHA logs. Second, BLS has instituted a program of research to examine and extend the previous data matching work. The goal is to learn if certain types of cases and respondents show greater apparent undercounting and to determine what factors might explain these findings. The BLS is also undertaking a pilot program of employer interviews to learn about injury and reporting and illness on OSHA logs and other data systems. This is not an, an audit of employers' OSHA logs, which is an activity outside of BLS jurisdiction. I want, to report, I want to repeat that. This is not an audit of employers' OSHA logs, which is outside of the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In addition, BLS has discussed with NIOSH the possibility of conducting research in partnership. BLS has already become, begun research with matched workers' compensation and survey data for a single state. Some preliminary findings suggest that a variety of factors may explain apparent undercount results. One explanation is that there are legitimate differences between the types of cases that are included in different systems. The academic undercount research previously mentioned tries to account for these differences. Another explanation is that some workers' compensation cases for a particular year are entered into the workers' comp databases long after the end of that year. In order to be timely, our survey collects data soon after the end of the calendar year, perhaps before some of these cases have been recognized. Finally, there are some methodological issues that might magnify research estimates of the survey undercount. For example, our survey collects data for establishments, while workers' compensation data are reported by company. When a company has multiple establishments, it is difficult to determine in the workers' compensation data for which establishment a particular case comes from. This makes matching individual cases difficult, and when you fail to match cases in these systems, it appears there's an undercount. In summary, the BLS believes that a variety of factors may account for the research showing differences between the cases captured in the survey of occupational injuries and illnesses and in other data systems. The BLS has instituted a program of research to understand and explain these differences. 
Within the constraints of its mission as a statistical agency, BLS will continue to work to ensure that the survey accurately measures within scope workplace injuries and illnesses. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fellner. Good morning, Chairman Miller, members of the uh, committee. My name is Baruch Fellner. I am an attorney with the law firm of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher here in Washington, and I very much appreciate uh, your invitation to participate in this important hearing dealing with the extent of underreporting under OSHA's complex record keeping requirements. I am appearing this morning on behalf of the United States Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest uh, business federation. I am also here in my personal capacity as an attorney who has found himself on both sides, having been a participant in the development of the law and policy of OSHA during his first decade and then a frequent critic of OSHA thereafter. I hope to draw on this balanced experience in attempting to answer the critical question that underlies this hearing, and that is, does the current record-keeping system accurately reflect employers' understanding of their OSHA record-keeping requirements? Before turning to my prepared remarks, uh, I think it would be important to be directly responsive to the Chairman's opening statement, and specifically to one of the underpinnings of the concerns that are expressed by uh, this committee, namely that there is an incentive on the part of employers uh, to under-record, because the fewer injuries, if I heard correctly this morning, the fewer injuries that are recorded, the less likely employers are to be inspected. In response to the point made by the Chairman this morning, let me rely on the report of the AFL-CIO. The annual report on fatalities in the workplace of the AFL-CIO points out that as a result of the number of inspectors, both state and federal, the likelihood of employers to be inspected, the seven million workplaces in the United States to be inspected, is once in a hundred years or so. It seems to me that the incentive of under-reporting in order to make uh, the likelihood to be somewhat longer than once in a hundred years is a small incentive. And I would think that this committee should look carefully uh, before it jumps to the conclusion that that incentive in any practical or real aspect exists for under-reporting. Based upon 40 years of experience, I believe that the steadily declining injury rates provided by OSHA and the Bureau of Labor Statistics are and must be substantially reliable. These statistics are the linchpin of OSHA's enforcement and compliance policies and priorities. And let me rely on the words of Richard Fairfax, OSHA's director of enforcement under both Democrat and Republican administrations, one of the most respected OSHA personnel. And he said that inspectors search for underreporting, and the Charlotte Observer said, quote, but when we try to track it down, it goes nowhere, period, close quote. OSHA uses at least two methods to try to track down underreporting. First, it compares information supplied by employers in high hazard industries with what is on their OSHA 300 logs, and then further compares those logs with medical records. And second, under its site-specific targeting program, it not only inspects employers with high injury incidence rates, but also selects a statistical sample of employers with low rates in order to find out whether or not they are cooking the books. And they have concluded that the vast majority of establishments are, in fact, maintaining accurate records. Let me suggest uh, that those who disagree with that statement ignore the complex legal, factual, and regulatory framework that human resources personnel on a daily basis are asked to implement. First, human resource personnel are supposed to decide whether an injury has occurred. Secondly, they are supposed to decide whether or not the workplace is the discernible cause of that injury. Those determinations are clear. When an employee, God forbid, has an amputated finger as a result of an unguarded machine or falls off an unguarded platform and breaks his arm. 
those decisions are far from clear, and the dispute erupts when the focus shifts to working with pain. And let there be no mistake, we do not trivialize pain. Pain is real, but the subjectivity of its symptoms and whether those symptoms constitute pathoanatomic injury, as well as the difficulty of ascertaining discernible causes, raise a number of distinct challenges for any record keeper who aspires to perfect accuracy. And let me further suggest to the committee that the issues are not only in the subjective area of pain, but they also involve the more routine injury recordation questions. Any recording scheme that has 46 sections and 200 pages of frequently asked questions has got to be a regulation which is difficult to implement. And just to give you one example, how much Motrin, over-the-counter Motrin, is prescription oriented and requires record keeping as opposed to non-prescription oriented Motrin and doesn't require record keeping? When is a soft splint viewed, uh, used versus a hard splint? A soft splint is not recordable. When is oxygen used for purposes of treatment, which is recordable, or prophylactically when it is not recordable? Put yourselves in the shoes of the staff that is trying to make these decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Innocent error is unfortunate, uh, but inevitable. Let me conclude with a modest, with a modest observation. Employers are doing a good and conscientious job. We can all agree that there is clearly some underreporting, and OSHA must remain vigilant to minimize it in order to maintain the integrity of its enforcement and regulation programs. But the committee should focus on the scope of the problem. The title of this hearing declares in no uncertain terms that we are dealing with a tragedy of deliberately hidden injuries. Such a conclusion ignores the real efforts that employers are making to accurately identify all work-related injuries in a complex regulatory and medical environment. This concludes my remarks. I would like uh, my more extended testimony to be submitted for the record, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Roseman. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the system to keep track of occupational injuries and illnesses in the United States. My name is Kenneth Roseman. I'm a physician and epidemiologist who has studi studied and written about surveillance systems for the last 25 years. Uh, recent newspaper articles have once again, and I, I really want to emphasize once again, uh, highlighted shortcomings in the nation's efforts to track work-related conditions. Uh, a basic tenet for preventing and minimizing any disease is to have a system that provides accurate information on both the frequency and circumstances associated with those conditions. Such a system is essential in order to determine how much resources to allocate, how to target interventions, to evaluate those interventions, and if necessary, to redirect the interventions. The current U.S. system to count injuries, occupational injuries and illnesses in the United States does not provide this necessary information. In 1987, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report counting injuries and illnesses in the workplace, proposals for a better system. As a consequence of that report and the deficiencies noted in, in the system, some changes were made. The most pronounced change was how acute work traumatic fatalities uh, were counted. You know, um, somebody um, dying because of a trench collapse, being electrocuted, falling off a scaffold, as a consequence of these changes made in the tracking system, the number of work-related deaths doubled in the first year of the new system. So they doubled. This 100 percent increase in the number of deaths was not due to a sudden increase in the hazards of work, but rather to the implementation of a new and accurate system to count these deaths. No such changes were made how work-related diseases such as lead poisoning, silicosis, work-related asthma were counted, or how non-fatal injuries such as amputations, burns, lacerations, or fractures were counted. In the last 20 years, I and others have researched and published 
multiple studies that the current system provides an inaccurate count of work-related uh, illnesses and non-fatal injuries. There is no disagreement in the medical literature that an undercount exists and that this undercount is significant. Uh, attached to my statement are 15 references from the medical literature. I want to quickly summarize uh, the work uh, of four investigators. First, Dr. Lay from the University of California in Davis, whose work shows that the current system misses 33 to 69 percent of all non-fatal work-related injuries. Um, he, he calculated using the current system that work-related injuries and illnesses cost the United States $170 billion a year, which is five times the cost of HIV AIDS and three times the cost of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, next, Dr. Bowden's, Drs. Bowden and Ozanoff from Boston University, who have shown in, in the six states of Minnesota, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington, West Virginia, and Wisconsin, that the current system misses up to 50 percent of non-fatal work-related injuries and illnesses. The next, Drs. Friedman and Frost from the University of Illinois in Chicago, who have shown that reductions in the non-fatal work-related injuries reported over the last decade are not due to improvements in the workplace conditions, but rather reductions in OSHA's enforcement of record-keeping record rules and changes by OSHA in the definition of work-related injuries. It actually showed that 83 percent of the decrease in the last decade were due to these record changes by OSHA and not due to any uh, reduction uh, in actual injuries and illnesses. So that even one would hope if the underreporting was consistent that one could at least look at trends, but their data says no. Uh, my work with uh, colleagues from Michigan State University uh, that show the current system misses 66 percent of work-related injuries and illnesses in Michigan. And we found that this undercount occurred across all different types of industries and for both injuries and illnesses. Uh, and in a separate study, uh, we showed that the current system missed one-third of amputations, and a similar study in Minnesota also showed uh, those results. So if, in summary, the current system to count work-related injuries and illnesses has been repeatedly studied and shown by researchers to have a large undercount. Expert panels that have reviewed the current system have reached a similar conclusion. The current system for non-fatal injuries and, and occupational inju inju illnesses relies solely on employer reporting. And I, the previous uh, speaker um, spoke to some of the problems with employer reporting. And, and our current system ignores the large number of databases that are not dependent on employer uh, coverage or compliance with OSHA record keeping. These include hospital and emergency room databases, poison control center data, state laboratory reporting regulations, state occupational disease reporting laws, and workers' compensation. What is needed is a comprehensive system for work-related illnesses and non-fatal injuries that makes use of available, non-employer-based data systems analogous to what now exists for traumatic work-related fa fatalities. Currently, the annual number of work-related illnesses and injuries reported is based on a statistical extrapolation from a relatively small sample of employers, about 150 to 200,000 out of our 7 million employers. Statistical extrapolation from a much wider range of medical data systems is essential if we are to have an accurate tracking system that will provide the basic numbers needed for targeting the effort to reduce these injuries and illnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Whitmore. Yes. Uh, before I get going, I would just like to say how proud I am to see so many members here today, and I want to uh, say how much I appreciate your attendance and involvement. Chairman Miller, Ranking Member McKeon, and other dedicated committee members. My name is Bob Whitmore. I'm a Vietnam veteran with an additional 36 years of government service at the U.S. Department of Labor. I have directed the National OSHA Injury and Illness Record Keeping System since 1988, and am the Dem Department of Labor's expert witness for record keeping litigation. I have been subpoenaed to testify today and I'm accompanied by my counsel, Mr. Robert Selden of Robert C. Selden and Associates. On July 17th of last year, my OSHA director, Keith Goddard, placed me on paid administrative leave in a non-duty status 11 months ago. 
therefore at the outset i want to make it very clear that i am here today representing myself as a concerned citizen one with over twenty years of experience directly related to the subject of today's hearing i am not here representing osha or the department of labor i contend that the current osha injury and illness information is inaccurate to impart to wide scale under reporting by employers and osha's willingness to accept these falsified numbers there are many reasons why osha would accept these numbers. Well, one, but one important institutional factor has dramatically affected the agency since 1992. Regardless of the political party, steady annual declines in the number of workplace injuries and illnesses make it appear that OSHA is fulfilling its mission. In 1992, Congress passed GIPRA. That holds OSHA accountable. And we're going to be we're going to be judged by where these numbers go, thanks to GIPRA. All of us want to see a reduction in the number of workplace injuries and illnesses. However, this reduction must be the result of fewer injuries and illnesses actually occurring and not the result of falsified reporting. It is impossible to evaluate the effectiveness of any OSHA program if the data aren't accurate. Inaccurate data also make it harder to know how to protect American workers from real hazard. To understand how we got to this point, it is critically important to look at the history of the OSHA record keeping system. That history can be broken into three segments. What I refer to as the taxi fare era began with the start of the record keeping system in 1972 and continued through mid 1986. While citations for record keeping topped the list of the most cited OSHA standard of regulation during this period, the fines in these cases were usually $100. Many of us referred to those fines as corporate taxi fare. From April 1986 to 1992, we entered what I term the egregious era. In April of 86, under the Reagan administration, OSHA issued its first ever million dollar fine to Union Carbide in West Virginia for inaccurate record keeping. During this period, I reviewed over 40 cases in which we applied the newly developed instance by instance penalty policy, allowing us to cite and fine the company for each violation of record keeping rules. I now want to make the second most important point of my testimony. After we began, began vigorously enforcing OSHA's record keeping rules in the Reagan administration, injury and illnesses went up from 85 through 92. I believe Dr. Rooster wrote an article in 88 and 91 with uh, Robert Smith that addressed that very fact. Employers, okay, why? Employers may have many incentives not to record injuries and illnesses accurately. For example, many plant corporate managers, physicians, and supervisors receive bonuses based on their OSHA recordable rates. So when you enforce the record keeping rules, Employers will be more careful to record all injuries and illnesses and rates will go up. The reported national injury and illness rates rose during this period and the leading occupational illness collected in the system went from contact dermatitis to cumulative trauma disorders. Does this mean workplaces are becoming more unsafe? No, it just means that we have had an act, we had a more accurate picture of what was going on because the employers were actually reporting injuries and illnesses. If injury and illness rates go up when you enforce record keeping rules, if you don't enforce the rules, will reported rates will go down? Will they go down? The answer is yes. And this is the most important point of my oral testimony. Not enforcing OSHA record keeping rules mean many employers will not record injuries and illnesses affecting their workers. Do falling reported rates mean workplaces are actually safer and healthier? No. Estimates about how many injuries and illnesses go unreported range from 30 to 60%. I believe the final period from 1992 to the present demonstrates that you don't, that when you don't enforce record keeping, reported injury and illness rates will fall. I call this period the report card era. Around 1992, Congress passed the GIPRA in an attempt to make agencies quantify their performance with objective findings. For the very first time, GIPRA made OSHA directly accountable for the rise and fall of the injury. Mr. Whitmore, I'm going to ask if you, can, if you can wrap it up, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, the information, uh, it doesn't take an expert to question these data when one looks at just a few examples. A steel plant in Kentucky reported no cases on their logs for, for 2005. No cases, a steel plant. 
Two other steel plants in Ohio and one in Pennsylvania had recordable case rates below one, total case rates below one. <laughs> Another steel plant in North Carolina, two poultry plants in Iowa were days away, rates of zero. And, large, and a large poultry processor in North Carolina had a dart rate of 1.1. Mr. Wood, I'm going to ask you to stop. We, we have a vote on the floor, and I want to see if we can get through at least partial questions at this at this time. So your written statements in the in the record in its entirety. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to do this because uh, yes, we're going to we're going to start to lose members. Um, uh, doc, Dr. Rooster, let me ask you uh, a, a question. Uh, in your statement, you, you indicate that you're, gonna, you're, you're engaging in, in conversations about uh, uh, BLS looking at, at uh, state and local uh, or federal and local workers. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. We, we it, have already expanded the survey to include state and local government workers in all states. Any discussion of expanding that to part-time employees, which are a rapidly growing sector of the economy in all, you know, in all employment areas? It's not just you know, to retail now, it's, a, it's, a, it's all across the economy. Any worker who has an employment relationship with an employer is covered by our survey. So we already capture many part-time workers, sir. I think maybe you're referring to the self-employed. Uh, and at this point in time, we have no-, no I'm, I'm, I'm raising the question of whether or not, in fact, part-time employees are, are accurately counted within- y Yes, OSHA we count part-time employees. Your survey. Yes, we do. Does OSHA? It, it's part of OSHA record keeping that, that any employee of a firm that, uh, that is covered by the OSHA log system uh, will, be, will be captured. The data for those injuries and illnesses to those workers will be captured. You uh, also indicate in your statement uh, toward the end that, that uh, BLS is undertaking a pilot program of employer uh, interviews. Any reason why you're not in, in interviewing employees? Our focus is on employers because those are the entities that provide us with our data. And uh, it's, we have a list of employers to which we can go to. Um, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses a sample frame which, is, which consists of establishments. But let me go back to the, in the testimony this morning and in a number of studies referred to here, there's a, there's a suggestion that there's a mis mismatch uh, between the interest of the employee and the employer. Why would you not conduct uh, uh, discussions with the employees about the reporting system? I, I think that would have to be done by another agency that has access to a, a, a role of employees as opposed to employers. We, our data frame that we work from is, is of employers and not about of employees. About the employer's workplace. Yes. It's about the workplace yeah, that yes, the employer runs. A major component of that workplace would be employees. Yes, sir. And, and I think that perhaps another agency, such as the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, could are you, explore are as Are you arguing you don't, you don't have authority to talk to them? We, we have a list of establishments that we go to, sir. And, and so we yeah, work on that Yeah, and inside list. of those establishments are employees. Yes, of course, they're employees. Of hearing. But, but we don't have that list. And we feel that our, our authority is to go and talk Hello, to the Although, you just, you like, when you, you're going to talk to the employer. You can't ask to, th to talk to, the, to employees in that same establishment? At this time, sir, we are focusing on talking with employers about So you've chosen not practice. to talk to employees? It, for this study, we have chosen not to talk with employees. So this study will employees. only be about employers? It will so we'll, be have about half the, we'll have half the picture when this study is all done. We are hoping to understand the decisions that employers make about what they record on OSHA logs, and w how they file workers' compensation claims. And, and this impacts, of course, the kind of information that we receive. Dr. McClellan, can we get there without talking to employees on, on, on a, an official capacity as to what's taking place in the workplace? Well, I can't speak to the regulatory authority of the, the BLS, but uh, I would certainly uh, concur that talking to the employees is important. Uh, Dr. Roseman, uh, Ms. Fellner suggests that this is just a mismatch of, 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 of data. We got people looking at different databases, and I think even Dr. Rooster suggested that we have different databases here. Uh, is that accurate? Well, I, I think the bottom line is we want to know how many occupational injuries and illnesses occur. And um, 
so, you know, do you dismiss worker comp data because you say it has different definitions? Uh, to me, those are injuries and illnesses, and they need to be considered. And clearly, all the medical databases, the hospital discharge data, the emergency room data, is being um, ignored. And so I would say, no, it's not a mismatch. It's just there's a lot more out there, and, and we need to be counting that. Dr. Uh, Ms. Feldman, you, you, you discount that, that information? Uh, of course not. I don't uh, discount it at what all. Is, what does if, it tell you? If, if, if uh, this country wants to go in the direction of uh, discarding the record keeping regulation that is promulgated. It's not a question it, of discarding it. It's a question of what, what, does the, what does the additional evidence outside of that system suggest to you? The additional evidence suggests that there are three times more apples than there are oranges. Or, OSHA or a third counts more amputation oranges. Than there were. Dr. Rosenman counts apples. If this country wants no, to go No, he was counting the, fingers, I think, uh, or amputations. No, no, not at all. No, well, there wasn't, wasn't that, wasn't you, you, the under, in your I, testimony? I would, I would strongly disagree. We're, we're all counting the same fruit. We're talking about work-related injuries and illnesses. We, the number of fatalities doubled. And now, are you going to say those weren't work-related fatalities? I mean, there's no question. We're not talking about pain. We're not talking about musculoskeletal people, d disease. We're talking about dead people, that there's no question they died from their work. And when you went beyond the employer-based survey, you doubled the number of workplace fatalities. And that's what I'm suggesting. We need a system that needs, counts all the other injuries, non-fatal and illnesses that we're missing. And what was the situation with respect to amputations in your testimony? Um, so I'm aware, as I sit here today, of, of two studies on amputations, one in Michigan uh, where we estimate that the current system misses a third of amputations, and there's a study from the University of Minnesota that has uh, similar data that, again, in Minnesota, a third of amputations were being missed by the current system. Mr. Whitmore, just quickly, because we're going to we're running out of time. We have a vote. I'm sorry, you can't see behind you, but we have a vote. We got two minutes left to get to the floor. Yes, uh, when you 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 cited at the very end of your testimony a series of facilities that had very very low uh, yeah. rates. Yeah. What, yes. You're you're telling us that, that that's just not plausible. That's just couldn't happen in that kind of a facility. A steel a steel mill could have to no. Say, to say I was highly skeptical would be an understatement, and you have to understand. Uh, Chairman Miller, that when they're talking about workers' comp and OSHA record keeping, most compensable cases are OSHA recordable. The, ver the reverse is not true. Many of the OSHA recordables are not compensable, but most of your compensables are recordable under the OSHA record keeping criteria. That's something we've known for years. We're going to have to. Uh come back for the, for, the, for the questioning. Hopefully, we will return in about 20 minutes. Uh, so the, the committee will stand in recess at this point.